Hi, welcome to Tiny Garage Fabrication. In today's episode, we're going to dive into one of Toyota's legendary motors, the 22RE. This particular motor is in my 1985 Celica GT Coupe, and the thing just doesn't run very good. I think the best course of action, because I don't know the history on this engine, is to pull it out, open it up, go through everything, make sure that the timing is in good shape, as well as the timing chain and the timing chain guides that are prone to wear and break on these engines. Next on, we'll move into the bottom end and make sure that the rod and main bearings appear okay. Might not get too far in depth on that, but we'll see when we get there. We'll take a look at how everything is. We'll finish off with getting everything cleaned up and I'll make a parts list to see what I have to order to get everything straightened out. And in a part two for this video, we'll go ahead and put everything back together as well as pretty everything up, get it back in the car, and see if it runs right. All right, let's turn two. I will start this off by giving you all a preview of how it runs, and I'll tell you, it's not good. Uh, with all the shakes and the rattles, there is a definite misfire, and we need to figure out exactly what it is. I think that it's timing related, mechanical timing being the cam and timing chain so we'll see when we get there i'm flying through the engine removal your engine could be in a celica it could be in a forerunner it could be in a pickup i don't know what your 22r is in so i'm not going to give specific removal instructions but basically pull out the cooling system drain the oil unhook the wiring in my case i thought it was easier to pull the wiring with the engine it's just three connectors under the dash comes through the firewall easily enough and then it gets removed in one piece then remove the exhaust check for ground wires coolant lines vacuum hoses and lift the thing out of here pro tip remove your hood first instead of three quarters of the way through unhook your bell housing bolts and starter I chose to unhook the transmission from the engine and leave the transmission in the car. It may be easier for you to pull the transmission all at once. It depends on clearances that you have, the, the vehicle that you have, and how motivated you are. There are six bolts to remove the clutch pressure plate, and then we can expect the pressure plate and clutch disc. This pressure plate had hot spots all over it. The clutch disc looked all right but we're gonna order a new clutch assembly anyway. Six more bolts for the flywheel and impact gets them off real quick. And then we'll inspect that as well. It looks okay, there is one big hot spot, but these flywheels are so cheap, I'm just gonna order another one. Now I'll attach the engine stand head so I can put this thing on an engine stand and get to the teardown. Now I'm going to speed through the teardown of everything except for the long block. Basically it's just being careful to unhook the connectors for the wiring harness. A lot of them are very fragile by this point, being 30 some years old. And then also I'm going to unhook a lot of vacuum lines, try to not cut them, I'll try to remove them gingerly. And then we'll get to pulling the intake manifold off, removing the wiring harness, and so forth. But for now, just enjoy this awesome 80s music montage to match this 80s Toyota engine. Another pro tip, try to keep all of the hardware together and marked as to what it came off of, like the AC compressor bracket, keep all the hardware together separately for the intake manifold, keep the hardware together separately for the motor mount bracket, etc, etc. Trust me, it makes putting this thing back together so much easier.
For this alternator bracket had an issue with it. You can see I'm struggling there. And it's kind of a mix between the bracket and the alternator. It's something I'm going to have to fix. Hopefully you don't have as much problem removing it as I did. Finally, we're down to the long block. I'm gonna pop the valve cover off and inspect the cam, the rocker arms, and the timing chain. It appears to be in time, mechanically. So I'm gonna check the valve clearance. It is pretty bad. And during the valve clearance check, I noticed that the cam itself looks not very good. We're gonna jump forward in this. I'll show you that, and then we'll go back to the disassembly. So the cam lobes, all of them have some score marks, some, some definite wear from the rocker arms. Now it shouldn't be this bad. And as we progress from cylinder one onto cylinder two, it gets worse. Cylinder three is much worse. You can start to see some deformation in the ramp for it. And also a little bit of a ledge on that right hand side, you can see that a bit of material has been taken off of this lobe and cylinder number four really shows that you can definitely see a groove where the rocker arm has worn out part of the cam lobe on both the intake and exhaust lobes so this thing is trash we got to get rid of it which is a great reason to buy a performance camshaft now an impact driver gets the large cam bolt out there's a spacer right here on fuel injected engines I'm pointing to. On the carbureted engines, there is an eccentric cam, but you need to make sure that those are on there. And do not forget this bolt. It's under the distributor, generally covered up in a puddle of oil. If you don't remove that, you will break your timing chain cover. This bolt was mysteriously loose. It was barely finger tight and we will figure out why in part two. I'll let you know, it's not good. Once all 10 bolts are loose, we can go ahead and remove the rocker arm and rocker arm shaft assembly. It just pops right up and those are all of the head bolts so the head is also loose now and ready to come up just a tiny bit of persuasion and she'll lift right off and now we just look at it for a while inspect the head gasket make sure it doesn't appear that it had anything wrong any leaks or blown out impact the crank bolt off my harmonic balancer shaft has a little bit of wear in it, some grooves. Now, I wasn't sure if those were supposed to be like that or whether they were worn over time. This may affect the front main ceiling and I may have oil leaks in the future because I did not order a new balancer. I remove the water pump. Be careful, there are multiple sizes of bolts and multiple length of bolt for these and they have to go back in the right spot, which is why you see me putting them back in basically where they came out right now. Helps me keep track of which ones go where. Same thing with the oil pump. It uses different sizes and different lengths. So as you take that off, just try to keep track of which ones go where. Try to not drive the driven sprocket like I just did. And then try not to throw the bolts everywhere like I also did. Now we can get on to removing the timing chain cover. There are a bunch of bolts, once again, different sizes, different lengths, including one on the back side of the water pump. Make sure you find and remove that one or you'll break stuff. And gingerly lift it off so we can inspect the timing chain itself. All right, great news here is that we have the metal backed timing chain guides. That is an upgrade that is highly recommended, if not mandatory at this point. The timing chain also looks like it's new.
I'm gonna flip this thing upside down, dump coolant and oil everywhere, and remove what seems like a billion oil pan bolts. I'll break the seal, pop the pan off, and look inside. There's some junk in here, but luckily it's all soft. It appears to be silicone gasket maker, and judging by the amount of silicone gasket maker on the pan, this is not a mystery. However, there are some metal pieces here. This looks like aluminum casting flash. I believe it's from the head. That is definitely a new head. And I think it just had some casting flash break off and find its way to the oil pan. Luckily, the pickup screen did its job and it didn't get sent through my engine. You know, a quick check on the main and rod bearings. They feel tight and I didn't hear it making any noises while it was running. So I think the bearings are good to go. This is a 22 RE after all. Quick inspection of the oil pan guide rail and oil pump pickup, and we're good there. Now let's get this thing cleaned up and degreased. I flipped the engine upside down so as to try to get the least amount of water inside of it. It doesn't really matter if you get some in there or not. Some WD-40 can displace it, some oil can displace it, or just some time sitting to drip dry and it'll be fine. Starting with light coats of engine block primer. Go ahead and get this thing started. Several more light coats will get it fully primed and ready for the final color. I went with a medium gray, kind of like the new TRD cement gray. It's very Toyota-ish, even though the rattle can itself says new Ford gray. I'll do a thorough cleanup of the head. It looks like this didn't get done by the previous owner. There was all kinds of junk, like thoroughly burned in there uh, from a different head gasket than the Felpro that was on it using a small stone to go over and make sure everything's level, deburring it basically, just in case there's any high spots. I use a razor blade and scrape off some of the carbon off these pistons. This isn't necessary, but you know, while I'm in there, it's not a bad idea. And that just about concludes the cleaning up of the engine itself. And now I know what I need to order and we can get going with one more thing I got. If you're new to the channel, then you won't know that I do powder coating. If you're a repeat offender, then you will know that I powder coat damn near everything all the time because I do. I also have a playlist that teaches powder coating. That's another little highlight of my channel. Feel free to check it out. Links up there in the top right corner. So I sprayed some silver powder on everything and then I'm going back with a wrinkle black. I rarely use masking tape or plugs on parts like this just because it takes so much time to do all of that. It takes a lot of time to remove it with just like a finger, a towel, and compressed air, but it works every bit as good if you're patient with it, and that's the method that I prefer. Plus, it just uses less consumables. Now here's the reason I laid down that silver base coat. It's just so that these three little letters can shine through. Out of the oven, fully cured. Let's take a look at that black. That wrinkle looks so good. It pops really hard on these parts. I'm super impressed with how it turned out. This thing is going to look amazing.
okay, after a pretty good thrash on that engine, we got it all torn apart, saw some things that were kind of suspect, saw some things that were kind of good. The head appears to be new, but it appears that the cam came with the head, which means that it was not properly bedded in with those rocker arms. So those rocker arms definitely gouged and scored the cam, as well as another issue, a break-in may not have been done properly. Also, a low zinc oil may have been used. I don't know what happened with the previous owner. I don't know how they did the cam break-in or the engine break-in, but those lobes on the cam are definitely starting to get wiped, and that is not good for performance. The timing chain was definitely replaced. It appears to be timed correctly, and the timing chain guides were upgraded with the metal-backed timing chain guides, which are good for longevity because that is a serious issue on these engines. Bottom end looked good, so I'm not really going to worry about that. Next step is to freshen everything up, make it look real good, put it back together, and we'll get there in the next episode. That's all I got. We'll see you in a little bit. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for watching, everyone.